uh, it's an honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Major General Michael Place. Uh, Major General Place is the Chief of Staff of Army Medical Command, and in that capacity, he advises the Commanding General on all matters related to healthcare and the Army and the military health system. His previous assignments have included Commanding General of the 18th Medical Command out of Fort Shafter, Hawaii, and Commanding General of the Regional Health Command Atlantic, which is the largest and most diverse health command in the Army. He is a distinguished military graduate of Johns Hopkins University, received his medical degree from the Uniformed Uni uh, Services uh, University of Health Sciences, or USIS, and has a master's degree from the Eisenhower School. He's board certified in family medicine and is a member of the Order of Military Medical Merit. So he'll provide a few remarks and then take some questions. So please join me in welcoming Major General Place. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I guess I'm between you and dinner and cocktails. Is that how this is going to work? Uh, just out of curiosity, here in the room, are there any medical people here? Ah, interesting. Okay. Well, this is going to be medically focused, but there's, uh, there's things that are not medical as well. So uh, thanks, JP, for, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Lieutenant General Scott Dingell, our Army Surgeon General, and our Senior Enlisted Advisor, Command Sergeant Major Diamond Huff, to talk a little bit about the future, uh, as I see it, of combat medicine. I'll, I'll offer to you that I, I'm not going to, you know, in the typical military style, fill the entire time with slides and graphs and, and prepared comments. Uh, at least half the time is going to be for questions, so please uh, feel free to submit those questions now. So one of the roles of the Surgeon General is to serve as the Army's medical integrator and synchronizer. So on his behalf and under his leadership, Army medicine, as an enterprise, ensures that the Army has the right medical capabilities for global conflict against a peer or near-peer adversary. Those capabilities fulfill our obligation to the American people and our fellow soldiers that highly capable medics will be with our soldiers in combat and the crucible of ground combat when it really matters most. Army medicine is seizing the opportunity to modernize in support of a multi-domain army. And to that end, Army medicine has developed a future operating concept that was approved by TRADOX Combined Arms Center and initiated a medical force modernization program in conjunction with our Army Futures Command to rationalize and prioritize our efforts. So, I think it's important for us to realize, much like we have the timeline in the back, where we've been in the past, where we are now, and where our future might be in order to determine what we ought to be working on. For, me for military medical personnel, we, we typically refer to the old aphorism that the only thing that gets better in war is medicine. Um, I think folks in DARPA would have a different take on that. They, there may be some things that they do that have made the world a better place as a result. But I'd offer that innovation is not new or unique to the military. But we've had some significant examples that we ought to share. Up in the top left of the graph up there, Major Gen Jonathan Letterman, the medical director of the Army of the Potomac, most notably called the father of the modern battlefield medicine, established the Ambulance Corps, a system of triage and dedicated medical evacuation that saved lives during the Civil War. His innovation of ambulances on the battlefield has informed armies across the globe for generations. Letterman once said, a basic characteristic of organizing modern health services is the distribution of medical resources and capabilities to facilities at various levels of command, diverse locations, and progressive capability. As an example of this, I've included a photo of the 8225th Mobile Army Surgical Hospital in Korea. That's the one there in the black and white that was circa 1951. That's followed below in the, in the color photo by a UH-1 Huey Medevac deployed to Vietnam with the 57th Medical Detachment, 
the first to fly them in 1962. For the rest of the conflict, Hueys evacuated approximately 78,000 wounded, improving the range and speed of medical evacuation from Letterman's horse-drawn ambulances. Fast forward to our most recent conflicts, whereby tourniquets were reinvigorated, tactical combat casualty care, or TC3, became the standard across the Department of Defense, and we created and implemented a joint theater trauma system. We modulized our medical capabilities across the battlefield, bringing sophisticated, state-of-the-art commercial medical products and devices to the point of need. Uh, probably a good example would be our critical care air transport teams that the Air Force has. Essentially, an ICU in the air that can go from one part of the globe to another. If you could scroll back just a little bit, please. As we look forward to the future, though, we will have systems like what we have there, what's called BATDOC, the Battlefield Assisted Trauma Distribution Observation Kit, and concept, concepts like Project Crimson that are unmanned aerial vehicles able to deliver blood products and ultimately robotic, autonomous, or semi-autonomous evacuation platforms. So that's where we've been. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're going to be looking at in the future. And I use this as an example. We need to acknowledge up front that the past 20 plus years of counterinsurgency operations will be vastly different than the future large scale combat operations that we've predicted. The battle space will be highly distributed or dispersed with lethal and non-lethal capabilities that rapidly converge effects with combat formations at critical nodes or maneuvering to positions of decisive advantage to achieve effects. To include with, and I say this specifically because some people forget this, but to include closing with and destroying the enemy. That's what we do as an army. I use this image to remind everyone that the Indo-Pacific theater is vast, with the entire continent of Europe essentially filling the South China Sea basin. Yet with satellite and long-range fires, the lethality, in medical terms, the injury severity scores, will continue to increase with the net outcome of widely dispersed, near simultaneous mass casualty events across enormous distances, presenting considerable challenges to achieve Letterman's echeloning of resources at any kind of scale. So given our penchant for improving efficiencies in healthcare by consolidating medical resources, think combinations of emergency rooms, operating rooms, laboratories, imaging, intensive care as a typical kind of package that's employed as a whole. The likely future operating environment poses enormous challenges to such a deployable medical system when all of those things need to come together in a time and place. So for many, future combat will look and feel potentially more like fighting in World War II than a birthday celebration at TGI Fridays on the expansive forward operating base in Kandahar. Combat operations will be more lethal, of higher velocity, and deeply individualized as it was in many instances in 1944. So the central idea of this concept for Medical 2030 is that the Army health system, as a component of a globally integrated health system, will support the Army and the Joint Force conducting multi-domain operations with expeditionary and interoperable medical capabilities during competition, and when necessary, armed conflict, followed by a return to competition under favorable circumstances for our country. The concept describes four general solutions to the medical problems associated with conducting multi-domain operations. Number one, empower commanders with medical aspects of command and control. Then to enable the operational force. Provide medical support forward to semi-independent operations and finally to optimize evacuation and maximize return to duty. So I'll go through each of those. So medical aspects of command and control focuses on medical information and decision making. Technologies that support treatment, optimize medical evacuation and improve medical logistics as well as synchronization of these functions are sought. Ideally, we'll have a medical common operating picture designed to provide real-time, on-demand, 
operationally relevant information that informs decision-making at echelon. Enabling operational forces includes solutions to maximize a healthy and fit force and effective surveillance capabilities that support operational activities, enabling risk analysis, informing protection decisions, and guiding other hazard mitigations and containment activities. The concept includes, uh, introduces a theater level medical command like I just commanded, but also it seeks enablers at the combat medic level to include visual and voice recognition software that minimizes or eliminates the need for, for written or typed medical documentation. Many of you are likely interested in solutions related to providing medical support forward to enable semi-independent operations. In this area, the concept proposes several solutions related to reducing the size of the medical footprint and sustainment demand including cube, weight, power, water, required lift and movement support, incorporation of operational virtual health and clinical decision support, system, support technology with lighter and smaller equipment sets to include things like robotic, robotic assisted surgery. Potential ways of doing this may include point of need production and leap ahead technologies such as micronuclear power plants. To optimize evacuation and maximize return to duty, the concept includes ideas that start at a point of injury and have application throughout the strategic, through, application throughout all the way back to the strategic support area, i.e. the continental United States. Soldier sensors for vital signs monitoring which could be networked to an artificial intelligence medcop that enables both treatment decisions and patient regulating decisions to a tailored medical capability, potentially crossing core and division boundaries or sister services or allies and partner capabilities, which drives medical regulating with modernized air and ground ambulance platforms using leader follower technology or unmanned air ground robotic systems and even autonomous systems. All of these solutions are in line with the tenets of multi-domain operations and provide the basis of science and technology's decisions that you will see in the medical realm. So, we have a crew that's been doing some ongoing experimentation. I recently came back from Project Convergence 2022, where we actually looked at many of these ideas already. That experimentation has demonstrated that we have three high-risk gaps to address. Hospitalization capacity and capability, the ability to provide prolonged care at Echelon, and ability to counter suburban threats. We also have a need for increased mobility at strategic distances, especially in the extreme cold, so I was very pleased to listen to the conversation earlier this afternoon. Experiments such as Project Convergence 22 have reinforced the need for advanced manned and autonomous ground and air systems for both medical evacuation and medical resupply. Our experimentation has emphasized the need for a unified, resilient, and secure communications network to reduce the vulnerabilities associated with individual soldier sensors utilized for medical data generation. All of this must be achieved through strict adherence to a joint common operating environment that enables rapid decision making with inherent store and forward capabilities during degraded operations. Most importantly, we, dem we desperately need the ability to communicate securely with unified action partners and host nations. We, we recognize the need to enhance our disease, non-battle injury prevention programs as well. We must reinvigorate field sanitation training for non-medical personnel, create, a technologi create technologies that minimize or eliminate DNBI threats, and implement standardized tactical combat casualty care curriculum for all service members, the next level of first aid. We also acknowledge the need to expand medical training to include a combat medical training consistent with projected combat experiences for our medics, realistic triage training for all healthcare providers, and training to provide medical support to amphibious operations. For those who don't remember, the Army actually had more boats in World War II than the Navy did. That's not true anymore. At least some of this might optimally provided, some of that training might optimally be provided in simulated or synthetic training environments. So we're clearly interested in those as well. Finally, we, we recognize the need to enable a healthy and fit force by preventing injury and illness through key programs like our holistic health and fitness program. So, 
to help stimulate some discussion, and as a summary, i.e. we're almost done, offer that we must develop capabilities to monitor the operational environment and generate a medical command, common operating picture with artificial intelligence and or machine learning to assist that. I think it likely that we'll have to utilize the medical cloud to enable and secure our data. There will remain a need for novel or enhanced detection and diagnostic devices for endemic, emerging, and or bioengineered infectious diseases. I believe it critically important for combat trauma care that we create synthetic blood and blood products. At the very least, substantial technological improvements on all aspects of blood product preservation and delivery. We need smaller, lighter, and more mobile medical technologies in all environments, especially in the extreme cold, such as in the Arctic. We will continue to seek advanced technologies to support prolonged care at all echelons of care to improve outcomes when evacuation is impractical. Army Medicine will continue to pursue capabilities for virtual medical care and remote medical procedures. Finally, we're seeking technologies that enhance the speed, range, and autonomy for both ground and air evacuation platforms. I'd also offer to you, though, given my time in the Indo-Pacific, that the Army will also be interested in medical equipment and conversion systems for trains and ships of convenience or contract. To wrap this up, I again want to express my appreciation to DARPA for the opportunity to share some insights from an old soldier and to thank each of you for your efforts on behalf of our future casualties. You may never be recognized for what you've done, but someday our collective work will save lives. For that, we are and will remain in your debt. Thank you so very much. What are your questions? Thanks. I'm going to give you this. Sure. Yes. Sir, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, again, here to help uh, with questions. So the first one we have is in large scale combat operations, blood and blood products will be a challenge to supply. Recent TC3 guidelines, I may have you say that acronym. Tactical Combat Casualty Care, yep. Thank you. Uh, state fresh whole blood is the most preferred option. Do you see a role, however, for synthetic blood products? Yeah, I, I mentioned that briefly in, in, in the presentation. I, I do. I, I don't see there are um, reasonable ways forward to manage fresh whole blood at scale. Um, for, for instance, we're, we're talking about, um, at least arguably or potentially, thousands of casualties per day, thousands of trauma casualties per day. The amount of blood that is required to manage that is enormous. And because of the distances involved in, in what this future conflict might look like and the dispersion on the battlefield, having sufficient blood supplies at each of the locations that you potentially have solar, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, uh, guardians, coast guards, and all of the rest, to have that at any given time with expiration dates and so forth, it, it just stands to reason that a new solution is going to be required. So having oxygen carrying capacity as well as clotting capacity will be critically important. And I, I think the breakthrough will be when we have synthetic capabilities that are shelf stable, can be kept on the shelf for long periods of time without requiring refrigeration and all the rest, that, that will dramatically alter how we manage casualties and how we resupply uh, across the battle space. So yes, uh, I'm a passionate believer that this is a future that we have to make reality. Um, you, you talked about this a bit during your presentation, but to get just maybe a little more in depth in it, as the Army transitions to large-scale combat operations, what new capabilities are you prioritizing? And then are there any opportunities, thinking that we're in a room full of people who are research and development folks, um, are there opportunities for technology to better enable those capabilities? Yeah, so I, I think off the top, um, the, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a... Um, an IT person, I think would be fair to say. Interesting that I'm here talking with you. I'm an idea person. Um, the, the idea that we would have the ability to see at scale 
um, across enormous distances to understand. So the idea that we could have a network that allows individual medics, the information that they're having on a casualty is aware at echelon all the way up to the theater level so that decisions can be made and predictive decisions can be made on, on what's going to happen. The challenge, well, that leads to the ability to make decisions. What, what, with our current technologies for surface travel uh, across the ocean the size of the Pacific, means that as the commander of the 18th MedCom, to make a decision of equipment, supplies, personnel, and so forth, from the decision to get to the people to move to the port to load onto the ship, for the ship then to transit the ocean to get to a destination port, to be unloaded, and then roll down the street to their final destination, it's 45 days. Okay? So we have to have the ability to understand what is happening at the tactical edge in order to inform decisions that need to be made in a timely fashion to be able to give the soldier what they need on the battlefield 45 days from now. Best case scenario. So understanding that is a, it's a network data issue. So as a doctor, uh, I will tell you the thing that we need the most in the top priority of our Surgeon General is exactly that. The information systems to be able to network from the, the forward edge all the way back so that we can understand to make the appropriate decisions in consonant that are consonant with the combatant commander and senior commanders along the way. So it's not a medical thing in terms of, you know, healthcare treatment decisions, it's not, it's not pharmaceuticals, it's, it's not new bandages, it's not new techniques in the operating room, it's actually the data network and how we manage that data to include with our allies and partners. So a medical guy talking, I need the network people to help us solve this problem, to manage the data, do it securely so that we can make better decisions, so we can efficiently get the things that we need to get to the people that need it when they need it. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. Okay. Um, and it, or whoever's but, question that was. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, not mine, but I was happy to ask it. Um, the, the next question is, relevant, I think. Um, there was a huge emphasis in, in your talk and just now in your, in your response about advanced communications technologies and then also associated telemedicine techniques. So are there particular places in that chain of care that would have the greatest near-term impact? Yeah, I, um, I don't know if anybody here knows Jeremy Pamplin. Um, he, he is uh, the director of TATRIC, which is a part of our Medical Research and Development Command. Uh, it, telehealth and technology is what he, he works. Uh, he, so he's trying to create a virtual critical care system that allows us to go far forward on the battlefield, uh, knowing that we're not going to be able, as I mentioned, putting all those capabilities together for a hospital anywhere in the globe is very difficult. Uh, we're all challenged by that sort of thing. Compounding that problem is that we don't have a lot of the medical specialists that are in those critical care specialties. For instance, Jeremy happens to be an intensive care physician. Well, he can't be at all of the places across the country that need an intensivist. We obviously found that out during COVID, that there are not enough of them, nor will there be enough of them day in, day out for the kinds of things that we have to do. So having the ability to see data forward from monitor systems and have that linked virtually with a bank of virtual critical care providers, doctors and nurses who are experienced in trauma management will be, it, it's right on the edge right now. We've done actually two experiments when I was out in, in 18th Medical Command where we took actual virtual critical care all the way down to a forward surgical team of about 10 people, a, a surgeon, anesthesia provider, medic, nurse, that sort of thing. And we're able to go to both Indonesia and Malaysia simultaneously and do mass casualty exercises there with virtual critical care. Now, there are, are thousands of technical reasons why that's very, very difficult to do. Um, so we had to do some things to you know, kind of make sure that it was going to work along the way that won't be able if we actually go to war. 
But that sort of thing is right on the edge. There's virtual critical care, obviously, that is happening across the country. To take that to the combat uh, zone and have it be far forward where it really can help people save lives, I, I think that's kind of the next big thing for us in, in the, the IT sort of area that can enable uh, success for combat health care. Um, the, the next question touches on telemedicine, which you've just talked about a bit, but also robotic surgery. So what are some of the emerging uses for robotic surgery? Um, take, to take it, I guess, a step further from. Yeah. So, so far, I, I, I've not been a, a big um, advocate for robotic surgery. I, I just, uh, I'm not sure that we have the haptics, that we have all of the all of the other technologies developed well enough to get there. So I think the potential is there for that to be enormously helpful. Um, I think the biggest challenge in a combat zone is the, not necessarily even the bandwidth to make that happen, but the maintenance of the equipment. They tend to be relatively delicate. Um, and soldiers, as they are being shot at and so forth, tend to throw equipment around. Just the way it works. So uh, I think there, there is a potential there, but I think it's more than just the technology that has to happen with it, or at least the, the, the delivery kind of piece of it. it there's going to have to be some, some material solutions to harden, to make it easy to maintain, and that sort of thing that are kind of beyond at least my concept of how that would work. Is there potential for that to be a significant benefit on the battlefield? Absolutely. When we talk about prolonged care, um, it, we're really talking about prolonged care at all different kinds of levels. So the medic, yes, but also as a battalion surgeon, a family physician like me is alone and afraid, uh, in some cases now going to be 100 or hundreds of miles away from anybody else, say, well, Soldier in front of me has appendicitis. We've tried antibiotics, he's not getting better, he's getting worse, we've got to take his appendix out. Gosh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just take the equipment over, drop it down and call somebody up and say, hey, he's yours now. That would be helpful. Probably more helpful than me as a family physician, cutting somebody open and saying, oh, there's inside stuff in there, right? <laughs> so, I would prefer that we had someone who was trained to do that to be able to do that. And quite frankly, the future of most of our surgeons is actually to do, uh, not necessarily robotic, but uh, there are all kinds of different ways to get into the body that don't necessarily include cutting people open. And because we're doing a lot more of that kind of surgery as opposed to the old style where you just cut someone open to take the gallbladder out, instead we're putting a couple ports in there, grabbing it and, and and removing organs and, and the like, you, you could see, uh, particularly in, in environments like we're talking about, that it might be very reasonable to go with a robotic option uh, for many of the things that we'd want to do. Still, I'd say the jury's out for trauma, just because trauma tends to be so dirty, so, so complicated with the blast injuries uh, and all the rest that having a single robot to be able to do all the different things that you potentially would have to do, there, there's gonna be some, some hard thinking, I think, before we can really get to true robotics on the battlefield for surgery. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned trauma. So as we get, so we think of the golden hour in particular when we think of trauma. So as we get away from the golden hour model, what do you think is a realistic timeline for providing echelons of care based on current technologies and capabilities and where do we need to get to, to be successful? Yeah, so I, I gotta ask, did somebody set this one up? Did somebody hear me talk before? Um, so let, let me talk about the golden hour. Is, does anybody in the audience know where that came from? Yeah, ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. It was a made up number. We just said an hour is, bad, is best, and we went with it. I'm sorry, we let it out, right? It, so th there is no secret to hour. There is no golden hour. You can bleed out in a matter of minutes, right? If you cut a femoral artery, it's minutes. It's not an hour. So if you don't stop the bleeding, they're dead. So what I tell people, I tell soldiers all the time, medics all the time, is faster is better. End. Two minutes is better than four. Yes. So 
don't worry about an arbitrary time period for an hour that has a label that has people that write papers and stuff like that about it. It doesn't matter. You can cut it off wherever you want to. The bottom line is the faster you stop bleeding, the chances of survival go up. The faster you get to a surgeon to take care of the issues, to wash out the wound and all the rest, the chances of survival go up. Yes, there are different levels in plateaus. It, you can get way into the details of it, but in the big picture, it doesn't matter. So speed is important for what we do. We, we are, I, I tell people that the combat medicine, it, it's, it's kind of like speed chess. Anybody here play speed chess? I don't, but they tell me that if you do your first moves or you move in the pawns, if you do those quickly, you have more time at the end to do all of the hard thinking that you're eventually gonna to have to do. The same thing happens to casualties. If you stop the bleeding early, then you can wait and they don't have to be evacuated as quickly. If you give antibiotics early, when someone has a contaminated wound, you delay the time until they become septic. That's helpful because we're not always gonna be able to move you, particularly in a future battlefield where there's gonna be you know, things shot in the air to bring down helicopters and, and missiles that take down ships. We're not always gonna be able to move you immediately as we have in our counterinsurgency fight. When you can dominate all of the domains whenever you want to, you can say, yeah, everybody's gonna to be to a surgeon within 60 minutes. But when you have an aggressive air defense or integrated air defense system, or you have uh, ships that are going to do long range precision fires, if you manifest yourself, guess what? You may well decide not to do that. So all of those interventions earlier are better. So for those of you that are involved, uh, talk about you know, decision science and decision support tools, those are really helpful. And if you can make those um, something that's readily available to, to users at Echelon, incredibly helpful. So, um, whoever gave me the rant time for um, the golden hour, thank you. Um, but, but yes, help us be faster, more efficient. That, that saves lives. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned empowering commanders with better medical command and control data. How do AI and machine learning play into these efforts? So when you're a commander, a line commander, not a medical commander, you're a line commander, you have all kinds of different things to keep track of. And you have staff officers at battalion and above that, that help you collect the data, make you aware, and all that sort of thing, and help you make decisions. What I'd offer to you, at least in the medical side, that there's some complicated decisions related to things like triage, to medical evacuation priorities. Who goes first? The, the, the example of the, the medevac helicopter that we had with the DARPA, DARPA triage challenge it is very apropos. You can't take everybody, so who is it you're going to take? Well, ha machine learning and AI can enable those decisions. We can get the data, can rack and stack them against learned processes to do you know, informed assessments, not just the best guess of the medic on the ground to say who ought to be moved. That's powerful. If you only have so much space on the helicopter, putting the right people on it is a, a life-saving decision for somebody. So I, I think there's, uh, there's enormous opportunities top to bottom. Uh, predictable logistics for, for a medical guy, as it was mentioned before, the 45 days, Incredibly helpful to know what we anticipate the consumption rates are going to be because I kept telling people, look, I have to decide before you even know you need it. So I have to think through what those rates are and I think AI and, and, and machine learning can help us with all of those things to make sure that we've got the right things in route, uh, knowing the enemy gets a vote, some of it won't arrive. Okay, so we have to have a certain factor to say how much excess do we want to have to have a comfort factor. All those sorts of things become part of commander's decisions and prioritization. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's, there's all kinds of ways that we can use those technologies to improve uh, survival on the battlefield. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Often military advances are military medical advances are among the fastest to transition for subsequent civilian use. 
Is there an established path to share medical technology advances between and with civilian or commercial medical R&D efforts? Yeah, I, I don't know that we have a formal process to do that. Um, our, our medical teams uh, tend to, to publish pretty readily. <laughs> so most good ideas are shared pretty quickly. I, I would offer that all of the service, was, but I'll speak just for the Army, that we are having more and more of our folks go to civilian trauma institutions to have them work there where we have a, a greater dialogue about these sorts of concepts, techniques, principles, that sort of thing, so that we share real time with each other. I think TXA is a good example of that. Uh, a, 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 a drug that stimulates clotting uh, that we've used in combat, that we, there's now a fair amount of data that is now percolated through the civilian world uh, to be able to say, look, if you have trauma that meets certain criteria, with blood loss and so forth, that you give a single shot of this and your odds of survival go up considerably. So I, I don't know that we have a specific way to turn that over, uh, but I think we're pretty well integrated with our civilian colleagues and certainly um, try to make sure that we publish our data uh, relatively early so that anybody who wants to know about it can know about it. Okay. Next question, what are the biggest, this is a, this is a big question, <laughs> what are the biggest medical challenges the Army is facing in helping soldiers recover from injury or illness? Hmm. So I, I think one of the, I'll go with injury first. I, I think uh, we have had previously a, a cultural um, bias against rehab, I think, in the, the military. That we, we tend over time to, um, a, a strong term, but uh, we, we have a number of soldiers who get injured. I'll just do it that way. Um, it, it is a, it, it's, it's tough business. Let me, uh, I'll just say up front, what we do is not gentle, it, it, nor should it be. It, it is stressful, it is physically demanding, um, and that's important because survival often depends on it. But in that process, we injure soldiers, um, not obviously intentionally, but because it happens that way sometimes. Decisions are made and, and accidents sometimes happen. Well, th the challenge I think that we've had historically was that was just kind of accepted and we just kind of moved on. And we, we kind of helped soldiers and then generally introduced them to the VA. I would say over my career that that philosophy has changed considerably. A couple of things, injury prevention is an important part of what we do now. So we have changed our physical fitness training a couple different times, both for the better, as well as I think at least some of you who pay a little bit of attention to this, our physical fitness test has changed. And that's because we've figured out that the biggest problem for generating injuries is us. Uh, what we were doing, like when I first came in, we were still having units that ran in formation in combat boots. Combat boots are not designed to support your foot, your leg, your back, and run in them. They are for walking. Yet, we did that for generations. Even when I was a junior officer, I would have to go talk to the sergeant major because I would discover another unit who is running in their combat boots. Now, there's a time and a place in the field to run in your combat boots, but going for PT, you run in the morning, that's not one of them. So we've gotten smarter in the whole philosophy of saying injury prevention is part of what we do all along. Th that cultural idea that, that we are soldier athletes what I tell soldiers, you're a professional athlete. Now, you may not be an elite professional athlete. You're not going to get in the NBA because you're five foot two, but you're still a professional athlete. We expect you, in fact, your job requires you to be physically fit. Therefore, we owe you a system that knows how to prevent injuries, and when you have them, to identify them early and rehab them completely to get you back to your optimal performance, whatever that is. It's a lifelong goal of a warrior to be able to do that. 
So I think there's been a significant cultural shift, which has led to all kinds of explorations for you know, different devices. We, we've got different braces that we have used with airborne units and so forth to decrease the lower extremity injuries and that sort of thing. So I think all of those are important. On the recovery side, uh, the Army has developed something that we now call holistic health and fitness, that we're using a combination of strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, to optimize their training and rapid recovery. Then, of course, we have the longer-term things that are combat injuries and so forth with our soldier readiness units and all the rest. So uh, I am proud of our Army, at least during my more than 30 years now, uh, of watching the cultural shift of saying that, you know, soldiers get broken and we'll just get more soldiers uh, to an army that treats them as professional athletes, which is really what they are. So um, I don't think we're perfect at it, but I think at least I'm quite proud uh, of our army to recognize that we have a responsibility to show, teach, and to monitor and to help them rapidly recover. What do you see as critical research gaps given the increased risk of non-kinetic threats posed to troops from peer and near-peer adversaries, chemical, biological, and tactical nuclear capabilities? Um, yeah, so I, I will I'll be, uh, Dr. Tompkins, didn't you want some people to be controversial? <laughs> Okay, so let me try this one. I think probably um, it, some modeling that gives realistic predictions uh, of the actual threat. Uh, I mean, I, there, I'll use COVID as an example at great personal risk, I think, in a public forum, um, because there's all kinds of different perspectives. But I think it is reasonable to say at one point or another through the pandemic that the, the fear factor outweighed the risk, or the, the fear factor vastly underestimated the risk. I think we have to have for each of these, and depending on the type of, uh, of threat, we, we, we have to have some, some realistic ways to describe the actual threat. It, the, the idea that, that there's a, you know, a, a nuclear blast, in a, a, a small tactical nuclear blast in a in a atoll in the Pacific, probably ought not to cause anybody a great deal of th concern in terms of individual risk, right? Just for those of you who aren't tracking, we've done that for, you know, I don't know, hundreds of times. The United States has. And not too many people have been personally impacted from a health standpoint. Not to say that there are not significant issues and significant threats and so forth, but, but understanding what that means and how to deal with it, I, I think it is important. Uh, but I guess to answer the question, I think a, a, a clear understanding of the risk that others that may not be um, health focused can understand, appreciate, and make decisions related to. There are a number of things that we can do um, for, for treatment and all of the rest. Everything from triage, um, you know, different kinds of modalities for, for treatment and so forth that, that would be beyond the scope of this, talking particularly about radiological casualties and so forth that, that we could do. So I, I think there are a number of gaps there, but to me the biggest one is really understanding the risk because I don't think we do that very well. I think there's a lot of emotion that comes with that, um, that, that causes behaviors that are, that are not necessarily useful. Okay. So referring back to your talk and some of the technologies you talked about that you've been applying, um, could some of those be applied to a platform such as a submarine that may have limited to no communication and limited medical personnel and supplies? Uh, so, so different kinds of of additive manufacturing and so forth would be helpful. The ability to, to create certain instruments might be useful. Uh, I, I think decision support uh, tools would be useful in that scenario. Um, we face many of the same issues with our special operations forces as they go to places and they, 
not necessarily because they can't, but because they make a tactical decision not to communicate, to have to be able to work through a problem set and give them options. So having um, tools to help uh, medical personnel make some of those decisions is, is really helpful. So yeah, I, I think there, there are some things in that realm that would be quite useful uh, on a summary. Okay, and um, we're, we're almost out of time, so our final question. Is there interest in devices for monitoring of medic performance that have the possibility for determining whether a medic is surprised by or confronted with a novel situation and then triggering an automated consultation with higher medical echelon. So I'm thinking this goes back to your, your AI conversation, like getting, um, I'm thinking. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think there's a general interest in monitoring individual soldier performance. I actually had not heard medic specifically. Um, but I think the understanding um, physiology and decision making under stress is something that we do have interest in. And to do that, I guess you're gonna have to monitor whoever that is. So um, our, our team is interested in, in monitoring physiology of you know, pilots as well as medics and infantrymen and so forth, both to understand where they are in the battlefield as well as to, to understand their performance and indications that they are under stress or in our circumstance have potential changes to their physiology that may indicate illness, injury, uh, wounding, that kind of thing, so that we can locate them and rapidly treat them. Um, but I don't know anything specifically for medic, which is what the question was. So I, I think it's, it's, it's broader than that. Um, I personally would be interested in medics just because of, of the cognitive burden. And I, I do know we have some people who are looking at that. To, to, it is, for those of you who have never been to combat, it, 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 is, it, it quickly overwhelms you. All of the things that happen simultaneously all of which can be important, um, in, in fact, can be life-saving or, or life-ending. To, to be able to process that all in an instant in time is very, very difficult. So one of the, the common things that medics have told me over the years is the hardest thing was the first casualty the first time I saw them. Okay? I've never seen a scenario. I've never been someplace with the smell, with the screaming, with the blood, and they pause. Some of them freeze. They are overwhelmed with all of the information that their brain has to process. So one of the things that we've done as our simulation centers is to expose them to that, to, to cause them to be, have sensory overload with noise, with smell, with movement, all that kind of thing, while they're trying to focus on casualties. Many of the medics that I've trained have been gone to combat and they come back and they say, that was so helpful to me because I expected it to be like that and I had experience so that I didn't freeze. That I could immediately go to the tasks that I'd been trained on and was able to do that first time out. So, not so much the physiology, but for me, the cognitive burden, that's a field of, of significant interest to me personally. I would not construe that to mean the Army uh, because it, I, I'm just kind of fast. Psychology background, uh, okay, I'll, I'll own it. I think that's, that's really an interesting challenge for us to overcome, and I think it has application for the civilian world as well. Um, it, they did sneak one more question okay. in. I'm, it's the last, last question. <laughs> um, I don't think JP asked them to do this, so I'm just going <laughs> to say that. Um, but it's, I'm interested in learning more about the DARPA triage challenge. And I think this, you know, comes, you know, for you, um, what do you think, um, what advice would you give to be competitive in, in a challenge like this? Yeah, I, I'm going to steal your thunder. It actually says, what advice do you have to help me win? <laughs> I'm trying not to bias. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, I, I defer to you as experts in the field of innovation, but it seems to me that breaking down the task would be important. Um, 
I think before you get to the remote sensor um, and the AI required to make all of that happen, that you probably want to scale that back some. Uh, I see and have described to others, so this is actually kind of in my wheelhouse, I see a combination, uh, some sort of, of goggles um, that have facial recognition that can, can validate um, with, with all kinds of different things that are happening, such as blood and, and respirations, that sort of thing, to, to have it be much more personal than a, a drone, um, to have it at this level, individual provider, medic, um, along with voice recognition software. What we teach medics during the primary survey is to say every step out loud. There's a sequence that we give they, you know, in terms of checking respirations, checking for bleeding, all that. There's an actual sequence that we train people to do that can, in my mind, as a medic, thinking about a field medical card, the data that's required for you to determine triage categories as well as evacuation categories, that a combination of visual recognition, voice recognition software enabled by AI to say what does that data mean would be the first step or an intermediate step to getting to a remote sensor to be able to do that sort of thing. And quite frankly, would have some interest from a medical community like mine that it would have practical applications to. So um, if, if that's helpful to any of you, have at it. Um, I'm not going to win the challenge. I know that up front. Um, but I wish you success because we could use something like that. Uh, so I'd commend DARPA for that. Hey, thank you so very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.